Okay, go. Is it comes out? You show your still photos. of you that that's the community and they will talk about secondaries and they're your interview how to conduct yourself in the interview okay 
So do you have that part working? There it is. Can we make this bigger? Oh, is it? Oh. Bottom left. So you want me to go to the, just go quickly. I'll go through these kind of quick. And I'll uh, just kind of start with uh, the capital. This right here is the capital of uh, Utah, state of Utah, as you can see. And um, this, this right here, I'm going to have to walk over here and show you. This, what's so significant about this picture is just show this right here is the Wasatch Front Mountains. And it shows that University of Utah is just sits right directly on those mountains. So I mean, you, you can practically walk across the uh, uh, parking lot and be on a bike trail or a, or a hike or um, backpacking or anything that you want to do. This right here is an aerial shot. It shows the stadium uh, there. And then it shows uh, the, the medical school and hospital back there in that area. It's about uh, three to five minutes. And so here's the front of the uh, hospital in the medical school. It's a nice view. So here are some of our staff um, uh, members, some of our residents and, and physicians that work with us. And this is, if you look uh, north from the uh, university, a uh, couple of minutes, just show, just shows a resident area in the Imagine U uh, that, that's there on the mountain. Area view of our stadium. And in the background there, you can also see the, uh, uh, the hospital and the medical school. The stadium was where we had the 2002 Winter Olympics. And uh, you know we're Pac-12 now, and we're playing Stanford today. Okay, about, about a couple hours. <laughs> yeah. Actually, about 45 minutes. <laughs> And this right here is Brian Johnson. He's our offensive coordinator who also uh, played for us. Um, the significance of this picture is that that, that bridge there, um, we have a track system that stops right here. And then students can get off this track and just walk across this bridge here over to some uh, student housing. And then this track system goes right up uh, to the medical school and the hospital. You just walk right across the street, and you're just, you're just right there. And this right here, the, the uh, building there, the glass building, is, is one of our uh, libraries. And those two big towers in the background there are, they, they call them medical towers. And uh, the, the other building there are also uh, student housing. And uh, there, there was a uh, old uh, Fort Douglas that's on campus, and a lot of these uh, barracks, if you will, were converted uh, into student housing and uh, uh, faculty and staff offices. And there's many places of worship. There's an Episcopal church there. Uh, there's an LDS church there. There's, there. there's many churches and places to worship there in Utah. Uh, this right here is uh, uh, one of the Catholic churches right there on campus. This is about 10 minutes away. Uh, it's a Catholic uh, Madeline Choir School. It's a beautiful little campus that they have. Uh, th this right here is a private school, Roland, uh, uh, Roland Hall. It's a private school. It's located right on campus. And downtown, this is called the Gateway. Um, if you want to go down there just to relax, to eat, to uh, uh, go to bars, clubs, and right there in the right corner there is a condominium project. That's the place you want to you want to stay. Uh, That's another view of the gateway. And this right here is City Creek, which is also downtown. And the track system goes right to City Creek from campus. It's about five, ten minutes away. This is another view, City Creek. And if you ever, if uh, later on that night after studying 
anatomy, physiology, or whatever you're going into. If you want to just relax at the depot, you can go there and have a drink. Uh, there's many uh, clubs there. Uh, this right here was, is a uh, Mexican fest independence festival that's puts on, uh, that, that, that they have each year. And they have the uh, Oktoberfest uh, that's going, actually I think, I believe that's going on right now. And uh, the Oktoberfest is up here, and now this right here is um, Snowbird. It's a beautiful uh, country, a lot, of, a lot of students go to that peak peek there and watch the sunrise and the sunset. This right here, this guy, if you guys can see it, he's tight roping. This is a little further south, maybe about 30 minutes uh, in the Provo area. And there he is again on Squaw Peak uh, in um, Provo Canyon. And if you can see, like right here, that stadium there, that's our rivalry, BYU. I don't know if you guys heard of Brigham Young University, but that's where they're at. And uh, ice climbing down in at Provo Canyon is uh, pretty huge there in Utah. Nothing I want to get involved in. But if you can see him, I don't know if you guys can see him, but he's right here and just shows how far he is. I mean, this is the road that goes up Provo Canyon. And he's just about to the top. And this right here is further south, about a, a couple hours south of the university, Zions National Park. Uh, this right here is uh, also south. This right here is Goblin Valley. I guess a lot of those rock formations are supposed to look like goblins. So that's Goblin Valley. There's a kid playing on the rocks. Uh, I love this picture right here because that's my daughter <laughs> hanging out. She's really fun. Um, a lot of arches down in that area as well. And uh, this right here is the uh, Sri Sri Radhad uh, Temple. Uh, it's probably about an hour south of the university. And uh, this is the color festival. And uh, what's significant about them throwing up the color is, is that you can bury the hatchet and any kind of stress or Anything going on in your life, you just throw it up in the air and just get rid of it. That's the significance of the Color Festival. About thousands of people go to this event each year. Just a little picture of them there and right there. And you have to go, please, talk we'll about the community later. clinic. Oh, you want to do it later? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now that you've seen what Utah's all about, so it's time to get down to business, right? So first you've got to get into medical school. So apparently, the secondaries in your application, each school is, is unique, and no one secondary is the same as the other university. But at the University of Utah, when you submit your primary application, so you have your, your GPA, your MCAT, your transcript, your letters, and then the, you list your activities, correct? So they talk about physician shadowing, your leadership, your research, da da da. In your secondary here at the University of Utah, we ask for a second statement. So in your first statement, basically, whatever AMCAS is asking you, you fill that up in. But for us, what we would like to hear from you would be, you may want to put up my lecture now, would be the green one, okay. yeah. would be um, challenges that you have encountered during the four years of your undergraduate okay, before applying to med school. Number two, what are the unique characteristics that you think you have that would make you be not just a student, but contributing well to the University of Utah? Okay. If, let's say, for example, you took some time off after your undergrad, before you went to medicine, before you applied to medicine, what did you do during that time? And why did you take some time off? So those are the things that we look into on your second statement. That's the best time for you to elaborate on things that you could not elaborate on your primary application. So when, you do, when we do your interview, we never see your GPA. We don't see your MCAT scores. But we will see again your activities. And this time, you will be asked specifics about each activity that you have listed. For your letters recommendation, I mentioned earlier your science professor and someone who has supervised you. So let's go into the science professor first. When you pick people to write your letter of recommendation, make sure that someone who really knows you as a student. 
someone who knows you as highly motivated and serious into going to medical school, someone who could really vouch for you in your academics. When you talk about the other letters from your supervisor, someone who has supervised you during your research work, how were you doing your research? How were you doing, doing your community service? How were you as a leader, if you were ever assigned a leadership position? I have seen some letters where um, they come from someone with a very high title, two pages. But what does it contain? They just continually list what is on the individual's CV. She did this, she did that, she was this. It doesn't really mean anything to me. But I've seen some letters that are kind of quick and short. They mention your credentials, what you've done briefly, but then there's a long paragraph saying that, you know, of all the students I have seen in the past 20 years I've been teaching, let's say, physiology or biology or whatever, this individual is unique, and then they list why. Okay. And sometimes they would list something like, this individual took some time off because, and they would list that. So for me, that's more important. Because you already list your CV, you know, we already know what you did. Okay. So at the University of Utah, we look into more detail about um, uh, what you list in your activity. But before we go that, I'd like to show you something here. So the U, we call it the U, we offer three programs. If you just want to be an MD, we have the MD program, which is four years, right? If you want a combined program, we have the MD and PhD program, and you would add three, two or three more years. So what's going to happen is during the first two years, you're a medical student. And in the middle, you break in and become a PhD student. And then the last two years would be a med student, and then you go into graduation. Okay. Um, next one. You could also join the combined program of MD, PhD, or MD, MPH, I'm sorry, and then the MD, Masters in Science in Public Health. This is more research oriented compared to this combined program here, okay? Now for you to be able to get in, you have to go to the graduate school. And whatever they would list on their website as their qualifications to go into graduate school, then you can apply to that one. Okay. Um, so I'm just listing here basically the deadlines. You submit only one application to MCAS and the MCAS distributes that to all the universities where you want to apply to. If you would like to transfer, you'll have to call the medical school directly. So at the University of Utah, we require a GPA of minimum of 3.2, both in science, non-science, and as an overall GPA. For your MCAT score, a minimum of seven in each category. Earlier I had a question, what if I have nine or eight in two? of the categories and I have a six in one. We look at the application as a whole. Okay, it's a holistic review. So we look at your letters. We look at your statement. And then we call you for interview and we look at how you respond to the interview questions that we ask you. And then we make a decision whether to accept you or not. Okay. We'll talk about the letters. Uh, next page. Okay. You put this in in your primary application, right? But at your secondary, here at the U, we ask for more details. And I've given you here basically the minimum number of hours or months that we would require for you to be able to get into our med school. So let's say, for example, community service. It has something to be that you do out of your own time. If it's part of your requirement during your undergraduate, we will not consider that. Okay. Leadership. We have some applicants who've never had a chance to be leaders. That means they never had a title, but it doesn't mean that you're not a leader. So let's say, for example, I had an applicant that I interviewed and asked, I don't have any title. Okay, what did you do? You know, do you have any challenging events that you were asked to do, blah, 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 blah? And then he cited one incident. One time he was driving down the road with his family and he saw, I think, I think he saw a house burning and something was kind of trying to get out. He stopped his car, went out there, helped the guy and started to tell people what to do and helping the individual who was trying to. That's a sign of leadership. So you could talk about that. Okay. Research, be careful when you put in your research statement at your application for your secondary when we are interviewing you. Be sure that whatever you put there, you'll be able to talk lengthily about it. Now, if your role in a research team, let's say, is just to look at the literature, gather information from literature. 
that's fine. Talk about it. But talk about what you have learned when you were doing that. So maybe you can say, um, if you're doing a research on cystic fibrosis, let's say, I learned a lot about CF, blah, 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 blah. Right? And at the same time, I learned that doing research is not that easy, that you have to have several people involved to accomplish the mission. Right? So think about what you have learned and outside of that box. The effect of your research, too. If, if it's a failure, the clinical implications. If it's success, say so. Fission shadowing, if it's mom, dad, uncle, or cousin is a physician, we won't count that. It has to be someone that you're not related with. And we recommend that you shadow physicians with different expertise, a pediatrician, a surgeon, a family medicine, an internist. And at the same time, it's not enough for you to list that you have shadowed X number of hours. I would like to know, what have you learned when you shadowed that physician? For example, if you shadowed a pediatrician, you could talk about the diseases, fine. But what else have you learned when you shadowed a pediatrician? Anyone? Let's say you were shadowing a pediatrician, seeing a patient who has uh, ADD, for example, in your clinic. What have you learned when you were shadowing that doctor? Maybe just um, different things about um, a response of the ch children or people that you see that have EDD and their symptoms and how the doctor related to and questions asked. I asked the same question to one of my interviewees mm -hmm. and gave a similar answer. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's important for you to say, I learned that mm -hmm. being a pediatrician, you not only deal with a pediatric patient, you have to deal with the parent. I had a, uh, an applicant who went to uh, India for one year, shadowed a, uh, a physician who was seeing tuberculosis patients, and this was for one year. And I asked him, what have you learned? You, said, you were there for one year, what did you learn? Oh, I learned about tuberculosis, da 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 da. I know that, I'm sure in one year, right? But what else did you learn? Okay. So you could say, I learned that the lifestyle of a physician, you don't really own your time. That physician was solo practice. You have to be called in at 2 or 3 in the morning. Okay. I learned that some patients are not cooperative in the treatment. So those are the things that you need to discuss in length on your secondary application here at the University of Utah. And same thing for patient exposure. If it's part of your job, it's good. But you have to talk about what you have learned outside of that. Okay. Next one. Okay. So let's say you made it. You got a call from us and you're in for an interview. Some institutions do multiple mini interviews called MMI. At our institution, we do one-on-one -on -one interview. So you may be interviewed by one faculty followed by another faculty, so it's gonna be like a two hour, or one faculty and one medical student. My advice to you is, regardless of who's interviewing you, whether it's a student or a faculty, be at your best professional behavior. So one of the common mistakes would be they go for their interview, the faculty, and they did great. Then they get interviewed by a med student. Oh, it's a medical student. You know, I can just be myself. I can just relax. But remember, we value our medical student's opinion. We ask them, is he a team player? Do you think you could work with this student? So we value their input as much as we value the input of our faculty. Um, multiple mini interviews, uh, some institutions do that, so you're just kind of going from one interviewee to another and um, it's, it's fast paced. But we tried that at our institution, it, did not, it was not received very well. We would like to get to know the individual, so it's more of a one on one interview. Uh, is this the last one that we have? When you come to Utah, we have what we call the interprofessional education. I'm sure all universities must be thinking about this, and they have this. But we recently had uh, established a contract with a uh, free clinic in Midvale City where our medical students will be work side by side with a nursing student. They will see a patient. They go into the room. The attending is there. Once the patient comes out, a pharmacy student is there to talk about their drugs, how to take their drugs. And then we have a PA student and we have the College of Health, like physical therapy, occupational therapy, advising patients, and if they need any therapy, we will schedule that. So our purpose for this would be 
to have all the health sciences know how to work together. Okay. And a physician knows the importance of what a nurse does. A nurse would know how important a pharmacy is. You know? And that's the best way, I think, to be able to give uh, the best medical care that we can give to our patients. Okay? And at the same time, we'll have our faculty supervising our students at that clinic. So that's IPE. Second, doing this, we are exposing our faculty and students to learn about cultural awareness because they will be seeing patients who have backgrounds completely different from their own. Low socioeconomic population, American Indians, African Americans, Latinos, we have a lot of that in Utah. And the Midvale Clinic reached out to the university to help them open this facility. And we said, yes. So if you come to the U, this is what you're gonna be getting. Is there anything else after this? That's it. Okay, so now let's go for the, the interview. So you got in, right? And you're called for an interview. And I have some advice for you during your interview. And you could use this regardless of whether you're applying to med school, for a job, nursing, or whatever. And I give this workshop every year to our um, um, pipeline programs. So, uh, OK. Personal statement. Because they will be reading your personal statement. Make sure that when you write your personal statement, it is in chronological order. There's nothing more frustrating than for me to read a statement jumping from one date to another. It's hard for me to follow. And it's hard for the interviewer to follow too. So make sure that whatever you write in your statement, it's in chronological order. Okay. What do you include in that? Who inspired you to become a doctor? How were you inspired? When did you develop an interest in medicine? Okay. And what have you done to explore your interest in medicine? It's not enough for you to say, oh, I got interested. So, what'd you do? Did you do research work? Did you, do, did you volunteer at the clinic? Did you ask people around? Did you sit down and observe? Things that you did. Okay. And what have you learned from your shadowing and volunteer work? Next one. What do you know about the medical profession? Some of us, we go into a profession without knowing what it really entails. We just know what it is, but then when we're there, we find out it's not for us. And you don't want to be in that situation. I've had a surgeon who was an ENT surgeon, and after five years of doing surgery, found out it's not for him. And he went into pathology instead, which is great, because I'm a pathologist. So we have an internist who, after practicing internal medicine for a while, decided, well, it's not really what I want, and became a pathologist. So, you know, find out what you know about the profession itself before you jump into it. And why do you want to become a doctor? What is it really? Why do you want to become a radiologist? Why do you want to become a pediatrician? Why do you want to become a cardiologist? Why? It's not enough for me to hear say, because I'd like to help people. We hear that all the time. I had one interviewer who said, Never, I want to become a doctor because I heard that of all the professions, being an MD, being a physician, you get the highest pay. Do you think he got in? Of course not. <laughs> because if that's your intention, you are in the wrong profession. You will not be happy. And I keep this advice, you won't be happy. Yes, you'll be garnering a lot of money, but are you really happy? Are you really doing your job in helping your patients? And what unique characteristics do you have that you can contribute to the profession, or maybe to the community? Um, in Utah, we have a big Latino population that's fastly growing. And um, uh, if you are Latina and you're applying to our medical school, and you can say to us, say, you know, I would like to go back and be able to serve the Latino community, I think they'll be welcome. So what characteristics do you have? And before you submit your statement, have someone proofread it, always. Okay. Next one. So the night before the interview, I'd recommend that you guys relax. It's too late to cram, okay? but don't drink, because you won't be able to wake up early in the morning. Okay. <laughs> and next one, 
prepare your attire. You don't want to be fussing about, because we're going to talk about this later on, you don't want to be fussing about, what am I going to wear on that day that you wake up and you're getting ready for your interview? The interview is a very stressful day for applicants. Get a good night's sleep. Okay? Okay, so you got in. It's interview day. So what do you do? Eat breakfast. Some who skip breakfast, you won't get to eat until midday, 1 o'clock, and you'll be hypoglycemic and you will be saying things you wish you never said during your interview. <laughs> Believe me, it happens. Okay. Okay. Be there 15 minutes before your time. So at the University of Utah, we, uh, we gather all of them in one room. They're all sitting there. But I would say be there before we even let you in. Go to the bathroom. You know, relax. Okay. And remember that, before we go into this, remember that when you are in that room, you will be sizing up. Other people, other people will be judging you. But listen to this. You are there to sell yourself. Never mind what the others look like. Focus on yourself. You are there to sell yourself and to make that interview work for you. Okay. For men, what should men wear? Right? Okay, let's go. Make sure that your haircut is neat. If you have long hair, put a ponytail. Okay, don't let it hang loose, okay? Men always wear dark suit, it's okay. Black, dark gray, dark blue, that's fine. But I would advise you to wear an attractive, nicely colored necktie. Because that will make you stand out. Okay? For example, I, when I'm inter I interviewed someone, I could not remember his name, but I knew he was wearing this kind of necktie, and he, we had a great interview, and I couldn't recall his name. But when I asked my colleague, who was that guy who interviewed on this, on this day who had a, oh, it was so-and-so. So it helps them identify you. The other side is, if you messed up, you'll be remembered too. So, anyway. <laughs> okay. okay, next one, that's a necktie. And very important for both male and female, personal hygiene is very important. I've got three offices, two of my office where I do my interviews, I don't have any window. If an applicant walks in, and you know what I'm talking about, I am in a hurry to finish the interview. I'm sorry, but it's human nature. I mean, you could not breathe, right? I mean, you know. At the same time, when he leaves the, my office, the second interview comes in, the smell still lingers. So make sure, ask your mom, your spouse, your husband, your, smell me, am I okay? Am I walking? Do you smell anything? Ask them, okay? Make sure that you pay attention to, because it's very important. It could affect your interview. Okay. Now, let's go for women. Okay, for girls, no short skirts, please. Sometimes you don't have a table. There's no, there's no barrier between you and your interviewer. You're just sitting there. So if you're wearing a short skirt, it's very distracting when you're fiddling and pulling your skirt together. So I would advise you to either wear pants or wear a skirt that's a little bit long. Wear a light makeup. I've seen applicants who, woo. And then you see them in med school, it's like, was that really you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and same thing, wear your hair away from your face. No low cut blouse. And I know you guys are beautiful, I know that. But please, for your interview, wear a close look, okay? And you could also wear a dark suit, pants and suit, or skirt and suit. You could always wear that. Okay, but wear a nicely colored blouse. If you do decide to wear dark suit, wear a nicely colored blouse. Again, for them to remember you, for you to stand out. And I'm going to give this example again. I'm sure you've heard about it many times. My daughter went to interview for her master's at the Columbia University here in New York. In New York. And uh, I helped pick her, her attire. And they were all bussed together, about 15 of them. They were put in a bus, and then they went down. And everyone was wearing dark suit and a white shirt. She was the only one who was wearing a, uh, we picked a very light colored, pastel colored suit that was um, green, but very, very light green. And when she went in for her interview, the first thing that the interviewer said, I saw you when you got off that bus. She was the only one who stood out. And she got in, but I'm saying, okay. <laughs> okay, and next one, the blouse I've talked about, and cross your legs, 
it depends. If there's a barrier, you can. If there's not, so I say wear skirt or pants so that you can cross your legs. But if there's no barrier, I'd rather that you don't cross your legs. Okay. Okay, next one. Interview day. You walk in to the person who's interviewing you. Do not sit until the interviewer sits down. It's a sign of respect for the person interviewing you. I have, sometimes it just makes me angry when someone just walks in and just plops into the chair before I could even sit down. It's not very professional, okay? Shaking hands, it's optional. I'd rather that you don't shake their hands unless the interviewer extends his or her hand to you, and then you can shake hands, okay? Oh, here's the thing. Do not make any comments about the individual's personal effects in his office. We have a, a one of our faculty, he's no longer with us, but he used to, um, he's in charge of the autopsy department. And his office is filled with all this different, you can just imagine, you know, whatever decorations that he has, stuff, animals, blah, blah, blah. And when people walk in and they make comments about it, you don't know if the comment you're making is insulting to the interviewer or not. And that would set the tone of the interview. I mean, it's human nature, right? So preferably, even if you don't agree, it's like, good morning, and then sit down, you sit down, and then you go to the interview without having to make any comments. Yeah. Oh, this is my favorite part, no foul language. A few years ago, I interviewed an applicant who had, um, uh, everything in paper was great, and the interview was going so well that I would have recommended him to be accepted to medical school. We had about 15 or 20 minutes to kill before the time was up. So we were talking about, you know, talk about something that would interest the applicant. We were talking about football. He was an avid football fan, and I'm not gonna mention the team. So I made a comment, just to kind of take his brain and just kind of challenge him. I made a comment, and believe it or not, he said the F word four times. I don't think it was said to me, towards me. I think he said it because he was so passionate about how he felt that, that he felt maybe, you know, he let his guards down and we were kind of conversing about football. But that to me was not very professional. You know, you're physicians, you're applying to be a physician. You have to learn how to conduct yourself in a professional manner, no matter what. You will be in a situation where you'll have a lot of stress in the ward, in your clinic. But you have to be professional. So, do you think he got in? No. So remember that, okay? So whether you know that you're with a medical student or a faculty, always be professional. Do not be arrogant. You could talk about your accomplishments. You could talk about your awards. You could talk about the wonderful things you've done and still be humble. Mm -hmm. And be sincere in your answers, be sincere. And last would be, be able to discuss fully whatever you put in your application form. Believe me, the interviewer would know if you're making it up, if you're just trying to say things that you think he or she want to hear. They can tell. Be honest. If you get asked a question about something that you don't know the answer about, you can tell them, I'm sorry, I don't know. Would you elaborate more? Let me find out. Can I get back to you after the interview? Be honest, okay? All right, uh, I think we're at the last one. Questions, challenge, thoughts? Ask about the school, ask about the curriculum, ask about where do students get the residency? Do your students go into the first top three choices in the residency? Yes, no? Okay. How diverse is your student? How diverse are your faculty? What about research opportunities for students? Ask questions. So I would recommend before you go into your interview, find out about the medical school. Search, do your search, do your work. So these are the questions that I would recommend that you search and then you ask them, okay? All right, any, more, any questions? Oh, by the way, about outfit. 
I had to interview one applicant. This was not for med school, this was for the residency, because I've been interviewing medical students, resident applicants, even faculty. I had one interview who came in wearing a uh, bright orange suit, pants and suit, and it was a male. And I think he was trying to make an impression, which he did. But of course, that in itself is like, as soon as he walks in the door, it's like, huh? You know? So, anyway, any, more, any questions for me? The reason why, yeah. Uh, I was just curious, the, the examples you gave about having thought out your career in medicine, you mentioned people who thought they wanted to be a radiologist or you know, other specialties. Yeah. How far down the road do you really expect us to be? I, I personally feel like I'm going to have a hard time knowing what I want to specialize in until I do rotations. So when we describe you know, what we want to do in medicine and why we believe it's the right role for us, how far do you want us to be on the path on the role that we think we're going to play as a physician? Well, I think, you mean what, what you say at your interview and your statement? I think that you should just be realistic and saying about, you know, at this point in my life, this is what I want to do. And this is what I've learned about the profession. Okay? I would like to be X based on X. But then I could still change my mind. Be honest about it. And as you said, yeah, until you do your rotations, you won't be able, even if you did already, you could still change your mind. Yeah. So. And the reason, I was going to say something about, um, before you interrupted me, I was going to say something about, um, oh, the reason why we showed you the video about Utah, because we have been getting, um, uh, the challenge that we have is that what people don't know about Utah, they're afraid to come to Utah. But I, I've been in Utah for 16 years. It's a wonderful place to be. People are very nice, and I said, I said, outside of your academics, you could go and explore the mountains, if you love the mountains, during winter time and even during summertime. Okay. Everyone's very helpful. And the crime rate compared to others is very low compared to other places. So. Any more questions? Yeah? Yes. How, how do you help the students that have a financial challenge? That's one of, we do not, as a, as a, uh, a government institution, at this point, we do have scholarships for students in the undergraduate, but for medical students per se, the scholarships that we have are based on your grade, academics, when you're applying, based on your GPA, blah, blah. We do not have a specific um, scholarship specifically for minority, but we would say, is this a scholarship for, here are the requirements, your GPA should be X, da, 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 da. Now, having said that, um, there are a lot of scholarships out there, like in the community for the, for the Latinos. Um, we have an African-American Chamber of Commerce, for the different Chambers of Commerce. We have scholarships that I don't think that students know about it. So what we're doing now in Utah is, as part of my job as the Vice President for the Health Sciences, is that we will make a list of scholarships available to everyone. The one that we offer at the U, and at the same time, what is offered out there in the community. Take for example, and I'm going to use an example, Terrell, right? When you used, she, he was able to use the scholarship that's meant for American Indians. But since they have extra money and he applied for it, he got it. So, so that's what we're planning to do. I'm planning to do right now at the University of Utah. So. For the MTN. Yeah. Uh, how about the alumni? Do you have a good, do you have a good alumni that uh, return to the school and give you some some funds to help the students? We do, we do. In fact, we have a very strong alumni association that put in money for those scholarships. We do. Um, for the MD PhD candidates, how much research experience do they usually do as undergraduates before, before venturing into the MD PhD realm at Utah Medical School? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, I think you'll have to log into our graduate program to know about that. But from what I know is that the people I have interviewed have very little experience in research, but then they pick to be the MD-PhD program, and then some of them get in. So you'll have to talk about the, uh, the department. Sorry. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I think that if, we take, if somebody decides to take a year off, um, yeah. besides shadowing, uh, researching, what else um, would you look for that would actually stand out besides that? Why did you take a year off? So let's, okay, so during your year off, you shadowed, right? You did your research, correct? But why did you take a year off? What was your reason? You have to let us know. If you give me the answer and say, well, I wanted to, 
I applied before I didn't get in, and I wanted to make my application much more competitive. I think that's a good answer. It, it's, for me, it shows that you are really serious in getting to med school, and you really want to make your application strong. There's the other thing. You may be asked, if you didn't get in the first time, you apply the second time. You may be asked, how many times would you apply if you didn't get in? And you would be surprised. Some would say, I would apply as many times as I can as soon as I get in. Uh-uh. For me, that shows that, come on, be realistic. Some would say, I'll apply, give myself three times. If I don't get in, I'm going to have to look for other careers that would still be in the health profession to help me. You know. But for you to say, for as long as I get in, it's, come on, re re really? <laughs> So, anyone else? Any questions? Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.